Hi, welcome back. So we talked about how a contracting system has to do three things. It must tell us what is a valid contract. It must provide rules for the performance of that contract. And it must provide a remedy in the event a party breaches the contract. Now we start with the first aspect of that. What is a valid contract? And in order to understand that, we have to look how our contracts for the international sale of goods formed. Now contract is a legally enforceable promise. The law does not enforce every promise, it only enforces certain promises. Those promises that are contracts under the contracting system. Now I mentioned enforceability several times but never really explained why it's important. Enforceability means that we have the power to ask the state to intervene in our private dispute and to create a remedy for your failure or the other party's failure to perform according to the terms of the contract. So what enforceability gives to us is it gives us the power to call on the state to intervene in our private agreement to use the power of the state to force the other party to keep the agreement. If you and I have an agreement whereby you're going to sell me your computer for $500 next Tuesday and I'm going to bring $500 next Tuesday and you show up next Tuesday and you say, I decided to change my mind. What enforceability means now, I can go to the state of Oklahoma, I can go file a lawsuit in the uh, Payne County Court of Law and require you to either sell me the computer or more likely to make you pay me the difference between what I was able to buy a substitute computer for versus your computer. The difference between the contract price we had and the market price that I had to pay. So enforceability means I can rely on the state to come in and intervene in our private agreement. So it is the contracting system that sets out what are the requirements of a valid contract. And so in this lecture, we're going to study how contracts are formed and how do we know when a valid contract exists. So let's start with that topic of contract validity. Now, oftentimes, contracts will require interpretation. And this is even more important in the context of international law because it's often vague and uncertain. Now, what Article 7 of the CISG does is it gives us the rules for the interpretation of a contract. And it has broad rules based on the preamble of the CISG that said we must regard the international character of the transaction and the need to promote uniformity in the application of the CISG and the observance of good faith in international trade. So pursuant to Article 7's interpretive rule, when we're trying to determine what does a contract mean, there are three principles that will guide the applicability of the CISG. It's international character, it's promotion of uniformity, and its promotion of good faith in international trade. When a court considers a contract, the question often comes up, what can a court consider? How does a court determine the meaning of a contract? In the common law, we have a rule called the parole evidence rule. And the parole evidence rule says that if there is a writing, if the contract is written down, a court cannot consider any other evidence, whether that is written statements, negotiations, emails that were exchanged, or oral testimony. It cannot consider those if that testimony is meant to contradict or vary or add to the terms of the written contract. If there's a writing, then the writing will apply. There doesn't always have to be a writing, but if there's a writing, that's all the court can look at. 
There is no similar rule in the CASG. The parole evidence rule that we see in the common law has not been incorporated into the CISG. So under the CISG, a court or an arbitration panel can consider all relevant circumstances of the case, including any negotiations, any practices the parties have utilized in the conduct between themselves, any usage in the trade, or any subsequent conduct of the parties after the execution of the contract. So, parole evidence not relevant to the CISG, when determining what is a contract, a court can consider everything that went into the making of that contract, including things like negotiations, emails, telephone calls that were exchanged, text messages. Trade usage refers to filling in the gaps of contract interpretation. The course of the United States and most other common law countries look to trade uses for guidance, meaning if an industry has certain widespread customs, then the practices involved there should form in part the basis of the contract. Now let's start with this idea of a writing. Does there have to be a writing? In the common law, ordinarily, no writing is involved. However, sometimes there must be a writing. And in the U.S. common law, we call this rule, this doctrine, we call it the statute of frauds. And what the statute of frauds is, it's not a statute and it's not specifically about fraud, but instead it's a rule that says certain contracts must be in writing. Contracts related to real property, for instance, real estate, for land, or anything attached to the land, like a house or a barn. Those contracts have to be in writing. The reason being that we want to avoid the potential of fraud, that people often hold real estate for decades, and the people that originally engaged in the sales transaction may have died or moved, we need to know what was the terms of that agreement, and so therefore the agreement must be in writing. You may recall some of the other contracts that must be in writing. First of all, any contract that cannot be completed within a year of its execution, or any contract in which one party agrees to pay the debt of another party, for instance, uh, co-signing a note, or acting as a guarantor for the payment of a debt. Contracts in contemplation of marriage, specifically prenuptial contracts. Prenuptial contracts have to be in writing. Why? We want to avoid the possibility of fraud down the line. So in the common law, we have these four different types of contracts that must be in writing. The UCC also has a version of the statute, and under the UCC, any contract for the sale of goods in excess of $500 must be in writing. Now, this $500 figure is important because back in the 1940s, when the UCC was being written, $500 was a significant transaction. And the authors of the UCC said, for a big purchase, there should be a writing. There must be a writing. Now, $500 is not a big purchase anymore but it has never been changed. Back in the early 2000s, there was a, uh, uh, an effort to get states to modify their UCC to say $5,000. That more accurately reflects what the drafters of the UCC meant back in the 1940s. That never took on and eventually that proposal simply died and so we are still left with this rule that says anything more than $500 involving the sale of goods has to be in writing. The CISG does not have a version of the statute of frauds, meaning under the CISG there is no requirement for a contract to be in writing. A small contract, a large contract, multi-million dollar contract, all of those can be simple oral contracts. And how do we prove up what the terms of the contract are? Any means, things like negotiations, emails, letters, 
phone calls, text messages, all of those can be introduced to prove the contract. So what it's important for you to remember on your test is there is no writing required for contracts that are governed by the CISG.